So if you've just joined the stream, uh, we're talking today about vintage bass tones, right? Now, it's kind of... So anybody who, who knows me on this subject, who, who knows um, where I stand <laughs> with this, uh, you know, maybe some people might feel it's a little controversial, right? But um, I, I tend to look into things a little more deeply than I should. <laughs> um, and so basically, a, a vintage bass tone... I've just written some notes here. Um, you know, wh when people mention vintage bass tone, in my opinion, be interested to know what you think. Uh, what you know, if, if if somebody said to you, "What's a vintage bass tone?" How would you define it? But to me, I would generally say they're referring to kind of '60s, maybe even '50s bass sounds. Usually '60s, I would say, uh, or early '70s kind of bass sounds. So, the, in other words, the kind of bass sounds or tones that you hear on 60s and 70s recordings. We're going to work mainly on 60s today because I think that's where most of it lies, I think. Um, and, and the same sort of... We'll, we'll dip into the 70s stuff as well. Uh, but, yeah, so, so that's what I think people are talking about. Now, there are some kind of myths surrounding vintage bass tones, which I'm going to get into it in a minute. But I would say, uh, for the most part, we're talking either that kind of really deep, fat, rumbly kind of sound that, the, like, Jack Bruce used to get and players like that, um, you know, through to more mid-rangey kind of tones uh, that you'll hear, um, like Chaz Chandler from, from the Animals. If you listen to the intro to, um, uh, let me think, we got to get out of this place, and um, the, what's this? <laughs> uh, I've forgotten the name of the bloody track. But, um doesn't matter, it'll come back to me. But if you listen to some of those Animals recordings, the bass is really mid-rangey, you know, it's really middly. Um, and McCartney as well, you know, his bass is, you think of it as nice and deep, but you listen to some Beatles records and, you know, it's more in the mid-range, right? Um, so we're talking about that. And I, I think the common thread is like the lack of kind of top-end information, you know, or treble information, along with... Um, you know, that kind of, like I say, that, uh, like that f fat, you know, uh, bottom end, and uh, quite often like a quick decay. So the notes don't tend to sustain. You don't think generally, I'm talking earlier 60s stuff, you don't tend to think in terms of long sustained notes. It tends to be more boom and it's gone, right? So that's the kind of thing we're talking about. Um, I'm just going to take a drink. Have we got any more comments or anything come in, Jen, we should look at quickly? Yeah, Gary's saying, I used to love Bruce Foxton's tone, uh, more contemporary. Uh, sorry, let me go back to this thing. Uh, more contemporary, though, or am I showing my age? Well, if you're showing your age, I'm showing my more than, because <laughs> I'm talking 60s, so, <laughs> so it, it's modern, modern in, in comparison. And But that's the thing, actually, Gary. Uh, I'm really interested to to hear what other people would consider um, a classic based on. And to be honest with you, if if you know uh, if we have time and people have kind of different views on what that is, we can look into that and maybe try and emulate those tones as well. So yeah, any more, John? Uh, Mark Smith says James Jameson used flats on a P bass. Am I right? He did. He did. Yeah, and 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 that is right there in that kind of like what people call a classic or vintage based on. I would say definitely. Mark Smith says Motown. Which is the same player. Yeah, so that's it, yeah. Um, and along with, um, you know, Duck Dunn, who was, um, you know, in the other camp, you know, same period, same sort of thing. Yeah, definitely. Cameron Sloan says, I consider my status and trace stack as vintage gear. So that's the kind of interesting stuff I'm going to get into in a minute. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm with you. Okay. Uh, let's have a look. I'm just going back. Um <laughs> Mark, Mark, randomly, this isn't to do with this, but I, I don't want to miss it. He says, went to a farmer's market this morning, bought some <laughs> fudge and cider, got given a chocolate brownie. Fantastic. <laughs> That's it. That's the stuff we're looking for, by the way. And 7T <laughs> base G. Yeah. Is that 7? Oh, my eyes, they're terrible. 71 base G might be, yeah. Hello from Ramsgate. How are you doing? I think I might wear my glasses next. <laughs> <laughs> um... And Mark Smith's in the Swansea Valley. Nice. How you nice, doing, Mark? Nice. How you doing? Right. Uh, I think Sorry, that's it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, um, so, so carrying on with this, this, uh, this thing about, um, you know, vintage uh, bass tones, and and it's really cool as well uh, that already people have mentioned like 80s stuff and seven, you know, late seventies, early eighties stuff. 
Um, because, like I say, I think a lot of people, uh, you know, stereotypically think of this vintage bass tone that they are talking about that kind of P bass with flats thing. You know, I think um, for the most part, anyway. So, so yeah. Let me. Uh, I've got some a bit of tech going on over here as well, John. If I can make it work. Mm-hmm. Um. So yeah, let's just talk about. Uh, you know the co- like I say the common denominator with this this vintage thing is is definitely and again I'm sticking with sixties for a minute early seventies is definitely that lack um, of 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 high end treble information right, um, and probably with the exception of like John Entwistle and maybe there were there were a couple of others kind of innovators if you like doing that kind of thing, um, yeah, and and I think for the most part it breaks down to type of bass that was being used so let's see if this works As Chas Chandler from the Animals, that's the kind of bass um, you know that he was playing. Um, sound coming back now to you, sir. Just give me one second. <laughs> I know what's happened. Hang on. There we go. Uh, I apologise for that. Yeah, I was trying to be flash. So let me just quickly run through this again. Yeah, Fender P bass, Fender jazz. These are all like typical classic instruments from the period. Hofner, like McCartney played, he made that very famous, of course. Epiphone Rivoli. So if you listen to the animal stuff, Chas Chandler play, played one of those. Um, you know, this is the, the, the kind of bass. that Obviously, it was an EB3, I think the one that... Um, that Jack Bruce played that had two pickles, but essentially, you know, that kind of thing. Scott, they're saying that the sound goes off when you show the stills, Gary says, and Keith Lewington. Yeah, not now, though. Ah, cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, so, so we'll come back to that in a minute. So, um, yeah, sorry about the sound going off with the stills. Um, it, was, it was mine. So so those are kind of, I've you know, kind of like the, the, the holy grail of, like, classic basses, I think. And then you've got all your burn stuff and, and Vox things and stuff like that. But they were generally kind of similar in some way to those, right? Um, and so out of those bases, uh, the Epiphone Rivoli and the Hofner, right? So Hofner is McCartney, Epiphone Rivoli, stuff like the Animals and what have you. Um, those two bases, if you just plug them in direct, if you pick one up today, put new strings on whatever, plug it in direct to a, a desk, it's going to give you a very vintage kind of tone because that's just all they do. You know, the, the Hofners are very hollow, um, completely hollow, actually, and they just do that kind of woody, woolly, woofy kind of thing. Uh, the Rivoli's different because it's got some mad circuitry on it uh, that either gives you just nothing but bass or nothing but, like, mid-range, right? Really interesting basses. Okay. Um, so the other thing that that um, that people tend to think of as you know being a, a vintage bass tone, um, you know, essential. Uh, somebody's already mentioned it is flat wound strings, right? So flat wound strings again, they they certainly added to that element of there not being much treble going on because they tend to not have as much high end information there. Um, or you know, I wasn't there, but I'm guessing you know if people weren't using flat wound strings the round wound strings that they had would have been really old. You know, I don't think it would have been a case of changing things. Because I think people back in those days would have been chasing, actually chasing that deep tone. You know, they wouldn't have been trying to get away from it. They'd have been kind of embracing it. So so any treble that showed up was probably kind of produced away anyway, right? So, so that's that. Um, and then let me just... Uh, and, of course, yeah, the... Um, 
the amp or recording method, again, a lot of bass was DI'd, like McCartney DI'd his bass a lot. So if you don't know what that is, that's just where there's no amp involved. It's just he, he played through an amp in the studio, but the, the, the sound of the bass was recorded directly into the console, right? But again, with basses like the, the Hofner, um, it has that kind of tone we're talking about. Anyway, um, and then production techniques. So I think, you know, that goes, sorry, if, if an amp was recorded, right, one or two things. A, it, you know, there weren't a lot of high power amps, right? So the first thing is that they just kind of break up. So that's why you hear a lot of kind of, you know, farty, buzzy kind of bass sounds on 60s records. Sounds kind of cool. Um, you know, and then the other thing is that for a start, there was nothing that had tweeters in there, horns, right? A lot of bass players still don't like them, right? But there was nothing going on like that, I would have said, generally. I think Vox actually did make something like that, but... Um, but but they'll have dialed it out. But generally speaking, big 15s, 18s, stuff like that, um, you know, that doesn't reproduce a lot of the high end. So you can see the common thread here, right? Um, and I think back in the 60s, I've actually got, I wish I had the book with me, uh, an old 60s bass tuition book, bass guitar. Um, and it actually talks about the bass as, you know, just being there to create this low end kind of rumble and support the guitar players right you know so um so that was what people were chasing they're actually kind of after that tone right um so i'm just going to take a little drink and take a breath and just see if we've got any more comments and you know what what are people saying about what their idea of vintage tone is for example anything come in jan yeah well i just uh, jim just says hi scott and jan sorry i'm late hi, yeah. jim cheery hi jim uh, David Mill comments, generally the bass had to stay out of the sonic space occupied by the horns. Yeah, yeah. Um, and let's have a look. That was about the lost sound. The lost, um, right, okay, yeah. Pat Delaney says, I owned a completely stock 59p bass for a while. Right. Every, everyone loved it except me. Hated it. <laughs> Didn't connect with it at all. Not my sound. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, because I, I understand that, and, and uh, we'll touch on that in a minute. Yeah, totally get where you're coming from. Yeah, so, um, and then we've got some questions which I've made a note of okay, well, all later, right. if we can get through them. All right, so we'll, we'll ramp on a little bit. So, um, so let's t talk about the myths, right? Um, so the, the, there's like a bunch of myths um, surrounding all this stuff we just talked about. So the, the, the biggest one of all is that flat wound strings were kind of all that was available. Now, they probably were mostly what was available, to be fair. Um, but but round-wound strings, I mean, Roll to Sound with John Entwistle developed round-wound bass strings in the early 60s. You know, it wasn't even in, the, like, the later 60s. So this is a mad thought for me, anyway. <laughs> uh, is Oh, and the other thing is that vintage basses, right, didn't exist in the 60s. They didn't exist because they were new. They were all new, right? So essentially, and like I say, it blows my mind to think that this, <laughs> this is a thing. You could go back, if you could go back in time to the 60s, go into a music shop and buy a brand new Fender Precision or even better, actually, a brand new Fender Jazz and put some brand new rotor sound strings on it, you're going to sound like Marcus Miller if you want, you know? You're going to sound like Bruce Foxton. You know, you could get those tones, but nobody did because that it was too early. That wasn't what people weren't ready for it, right? Um, so, so I think what's happened over time is people think, oh yeah, yeah, you got to have an old fifties P bass to get that vintage tone. And I just don't think it's the case. I think um, you've got to use certain approaches. Round uh, flat wound strings will 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 do it, and 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 whatever. But do you know what I'm saying? I think um, yeah, it's really interesting to think that. Fender basses, you know, back then were, you know, they're the same as they are now, essentially, right? And, and put new strings on and you'd have just as like modern or bright a tone as you get today. That's mad, isn't it, Jan? Yeah, well, interesting comment from 71 Bass G says, I think a lot of bass tone was a compromise due to the amps available at the time. This is it. See, I've mentioned that as, as, as uh, one of the components. It's just a bunch of different elements, right? Uh, and I don't think there was any one particular thing. And like I say, it was either people just had old strings on or an amp that didn't produce treble um, or they did have flat wound strings on. I don't think people probably paid massive attention to the setup of the bass back then. I, I, I guess, you know, 
um, because it would just, you know, intended to do that woolly, woofy thing. And that is the tone that engineers would chase and, and, you know, probably even players. It was like probably the deeper, the fatter the tone, the more like, you know, <laughs> the better. So, um, so yeah, I find it really interesting. So that's kind of like a little bit of a myth. I, I, and, and I love that idea that, that somebody could have, you know, really changed things. Entwistle was doing it, wasn't he? He was, he was really pushing the envelope with that stuff. Um, Jim, Jim's made uh, an interesting point as well, because obviously there's the live thing uh, with the amps. That, right. That would have been, the you know, um, the live sound yeah. at the time. Yeah. But Jim said you struggle to hear the bass on the old seven inches. And he said, I used to play the seven inches at 78 to pick out the bass when I had to learn bass lines. That's a great thing. Right, pre, yeah. Pre-YouTube. Right, yeah, yeah. So, so even in the recording of the yeah. basses, you know, obviously the mixes and everything were obviously different. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And um, that's a really cool thing that used to slow it down to, so it pulled it out more. I love that because um, I know a lot of people speed it up so it sounds more guitar but I get that because it was so rumbly you, you're going to feel those frequencies more sorry that was David Milne that commented about playing it at 78 but Jim pointed no, out no 78 yeah, you did speed it up that's right yeah you did the thing yeah, yeah, but yeah. Jim yeah, was saying it. you struggled to hear the bass on the old 7 inches yeah definitely um, you know so um, so yeah and, and, and another just interesting little fact as well is this doesn't apply to the 60s thing and I know I said I'd talk about that more um but it's is the fact that active basses are not a new thing at all you know uh, again people think of like oh yeah modern modern active bass you know um but they're not you know they they you know like burns um had one going down in the 60s believe it or not let me see if I can pull that up on on the screen this guy uh you know that had a, some transistorized pickups i believe uh it wasn't particularly <laughs> successful <laughs> because uh it was very you know it, it was prone to, to going wrong and you couldn't easily repair it and also vox um they were making you know active bases they did all kinds of mad stuff did vox they put um all kinds of weird circuitry in, like organs and stuff you know so there was a lot of that mad stuff going on and and of course in the 70s you know alembic which stanley clark played and you know wild basses and music man they were all making active basses really really early on you know like 70s early 70s what was the stingray was it 74 wild 73 something like that anyway so yeah very interesting so so with all that um put to one side what is the deal we're trying to get that kind of sound on a modern but what we should do actually let's let's listen to as near as a vintage bass as I've got, so so we can hear what we're talking about. So we're going to use almost <laughs> almost the right tools for a minute, the right tools, uh, and then we'll get into uh, the way that I get these kind of tones without those tools. So uh, while I change bases, Jan, any more questions or anything? Yeah, David Mill. Now, I don't know this. Is this a, a specific sound that they used to go for back in the 60s or whatever? It says felt picks on flat wound strings. He said he loves loves that sound. Yeah, that, that's a very cool thing. And I ain't got any felt picks. Um, what, was that a specific sort of thing that people were doing at a certain era? Well, I'm going to be honest. I know all, I know, I know all about I know about the felt picks thing, but I've never had one, so I've never really been able to kind of look into that. But yeah, it was definitely a thing, and it gave you, you know, a much softer attack than than you get with um, with a hard pick. You know, it was because it's it's felt. It was mm. hard hard mm. felt, mm. Um, heart felt. <laughs> but yeah, good call, good point. Any more, Jam? Uh, no, that's it. I've okay. got got some questions for when you finish your. Um, okay, me do dog. doing your thing. Okay. <laughs> So this bass I've got here, just out of interest, what are people's thoughts on, on that, by the way? The fact that, you know, like a, a modern brand new Fender Jazz or, or P bass, you know, it's the same. You know, it's, 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 it's kind of like the same as it was back there. Yes, they've made some changes and stuff. But what I mean is... There weren't vintage bases around that. Somebody's actually made this comment on uh, on my Facebook. I'm struggling a bit to find my lead here, so I don't know if you want to pull one of those questions up, Jam. Yeah, okay. Uh, so Mark Smith says, what's your definition of bass player? 
Um, well, I, 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 wow, somebody that plays a guitar that's that's derived from uh, so I don't know <laughs> a bass player. It's, it's a yeah, it can be different things. It's some because uh, basses can be different, can't they? I mean, I'm a bass guitar player, so that you know I can define that in that I play a guitar that's tuned a little bit lower than a regular six string guitar usually. And and it's and for me, you know, mine tend to have four strings, but then it gets a little blurred, doesn't it? Because you know, people play six string basses now. I have a piccolo bass, but I think for for the most part, that's what I would you know call is is a lower register guitar. You know, essentially, I think that's that's the what I am. Um, I'm not a lower register guitar player one. <laughs> Any more, John? Yeah, did you answer Mark Smith? He said James Jameson used flats on a P bass. Am I, I right? I did, yeah, you yeah. Did, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Nigel Pickering, fingers or pick? Uh, pick all the way. No, I'm only kidding. Right, so think both, uh, Nigel, actually. Um, sorry about this, guys. So, yeah, this is the one that needs the nut changing on it. So that's why I'm tuning it strangely. Yeah. Um, both really um there was that thing in the 80s wasn't there where and maybe the 70s you know where people were like oh you're not a proper bass player if you don't use your fingers and that and i think that obviously has fizzled out now but um is he talking about now or is he talking about vintage time oh i don't know don't know yeah, I, sure. maybe it's a, yeah i mean certainly if we're talking vintage right if we're talking 60s vintage then um then either really but the pick sounds that you would go for, it's somebody mentioned felt picks, and, and for me it would be more like a you know thicker nylon pick, uh, not that kind of really atta- you know high end attacky thing that you might use for like rock or punk or whatever you know. I say both, so kind of yeah, now and yeah. then. And he's also um, asking why do flat wound string uh, why do flat wounds mm-hmm. sound different to round wound strings? I don't actually technically know why it is, you know. Um, I, I, I'm guessing because the, there's more of, of the winding in contact with the core, you know, whereas with round wound strings, because the winding's round, you know, it's kind of like it's just sitting, there's just little bits of it touching the core. So I guess it dampens the string less, I think. It'd be interesting if somebody out there knows uh, the technical reason for that. Mark Smith was asking, did they put foam under the strings next to the, next to the bridge? See, again, that's, yeah, that's something that I kind of missed out. Some basses did, like Fender stuck a bit of foam under the, the cover so that when you put the cover on, it muted the strings. Rickenbackers, that's a vintage bass too. Again, how modern, how like bright and, and, and punchy did Rickenbackers end up sounding? Um, and again, you know, you, you think of the, the, the 60s and 70s stuff as more of a plummy, flat woundy sound. But again, I think they had mutes and Stingrays did, didn't they, as well, I think. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, check it out. This is... Um, so this is what I'm talking about. I'll probably have to turn that up because it's duller than uh, than what I, than what I'd normally do. <laughs> and, uh, and what I've got going on here is some, you know, reasonably old flat wound strings. I've got um, a pickup. I wonder if we can zoom in a little bit on this. Let's try. I've got a pickup that is kind of emulating. You know, it's a Seymour Duncan, and it's it's like emulating um, a vintage P bass pickup, right? Flat wound strings, regular old style bridge, which is just like a thin piece of bent metal, which that does actually add to that kind of sixties-y thing people talk about. I've got the tone rolled down a little bit, and I'm just di'd. There's no amp or anything, right? Yeah. <laughs> Right, so that's I think that's kind of ballpark, um, but I'm calling this vintage. Right, this, this is kind of almost almost like using the right gear in inverted commas. Now, um, why would you not just do that? That's the, that's might be a question somebody might have out there. Why why would why would I not just simply you know use a vintage bass to get that tone? And so a couple of things about that. This is a personal thing. It's nothing I'm, I'm worried about sharing, don't worry. But for me, um, I've never been into collecting. I've never been into vintage stuff, right? If I buy instruments to play, 
you know, and I and I realised that early on that a fender base is two chunks of wood screwed together, and you know, and and you can get a great P bass sound out of you know a well made P bass. It doesn't have to be uh, from a particular vintage or whatever. Um, so so yeah, so I've always kind of that's that's number one why I've never owned vintage stuff because I I know for a fact you know when a new shiny thing would rear its head I'd, I'd sell it and get something else so um so that's part of it but the other thing is because i came up like a lot of you guys as well you know um on players that we were listening to maybe in the 70s or 80s you know like for me it was guys like mark king and all those kind of players stan clark in the 70s and 80s um you know a lot of people mentioned stuff like bruce foxton and you know, Geddy Lee, whatever, you know, they were all getting much more progressive kind of tones by that point. And, um, you know, that, that, that was the kind of thing we were going for. So, so for me, it was that kind of vintage tone has always been something I'd like to be able to pull out the bag if I need to on a session or on a gig, you know, if we just happened to do a rock and roll tune or something like that, that I'd be able to just dip into that and, and pull it out of the bag, you know? So, um, so yeah, um, any more questions before I just carry on, Jam? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, Gary Denny says I just finished building an active P base for someone right. with a twenty-two fret LED neck. Sa- wow. Sacrilege. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> uh, and Gary also commented on the strings. Round wounds produce a more re- uh, resonant, sustainable st- uh, standing wave. There's a right. lot more to it than that, though, materials, etc. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, I, I, I didn't pretend, yeah, I wouldn't pretend to know the, the text. So thanks for that, Gary. Yeah, Yeah. so hopefully that answered Nigel, uh, who, who also says, studio's looking great, by the way. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, David Milne says, Carol Kay, enough said. Yeah, that's another classic of, yeah, that kind of tone we're talking about. Pick playing, of course, you know. Uh, Fantastic. Mark, Mark Smith says, personally, I much prefer round wounds. Flat sound dull to me, uh, but Scott can make anything sound good. Oh, that's too kind. <laughs> it is a completely different sound, isn't it? Yeah, it is. So let, let's just go for that. Now, this is, you know, like, so really quick, that thing that somebody mentioned earlier about the, um, you know, the Trace Elliott stuff and things like that, this is what's really funny, is in the history of the bass guitar, right, those 60s sounds, and even 70s, but certainly 60s, those were sounds only a few years, really, after the bass was actually even invented, right? And you think how many decades have gone past that, right? <laughs> um, so, so yeah, like now, you know, Mark King's, uh, you know, uh, JD tone is like way more vintage than, you know, when we were in the 80s listening to 60s stuff. It's mad, right? So, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of weird because I still think of, you know, Stu Ham's tone in the 80s is very modern, but it's not really, is it now? <laughs> I mean, it sounds great. It is still a modern tone. It doesn't even sound dated, but interesting, right? So, yeah, so this is, you know, it's not working. This is a fully active bass that's got EMGs. Now, that's funny, isn't it? Because EMGs have been around a long time too. Let me find out where it's not actually working first. All the S of not being plugged in. There we go. Doing well today, aren't I, Jan? Yeah, right. very well. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Right. So yeah. So this has got like full, um, you know, active electronics. Um, it's got EMG pickups in it, and it's got. Um, I think I've got 18 volts going on, two batteries in there. It's got a bass, cut and boost control, and a treble cut and boost, and even an active balance control. Right. So this, this, uh, it, 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 it's the pan part, um, but it does some kind of. A cool thing where you know when you put both pickups on at the same volume you get that uh, what's it called gary will know there's a word for it i've forgotten um where the volume dips a little bit um but this kind of compensates for it so it's a very you know it's about as active it's about as far away from 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 that and it's got really lightweight 30 to 90 round wound strings they're not brand new they're a few weeks old um but that'll help with the vintage sound. <laughs> Yeah, so you can hear it's it's totally different. Let me play the same sort of way I was playing that, right? Mm-hmm. 
So you can hear straight away, it's completely different, right? It's got that, um, it's got much more high-end information. You could go crazy with it. Right? So, yeah, it's it's a totally different beast. And you would not think that that is ever going to make some kind of, you know, good job of doing a kind of 60 storm. Maybe it won't. <laughs> but this is better. Okay, so before I crack into this, has anybody, like, come up with any suggestions, any ways that they emulate vintage bass tones, other than changing the strings, which you can't do in the middle of a gig or something like that? No, they haven't, actually. No? No. I would, they haven't right, okay. come up with their own ways that, right. that I can say that, unless I've missed uh, some comments, but I don't think so. I need to ask a favour, Janet Whitley, of what is you. It? Yeah. <laughs> I need you to rip that foam tile off the wall that's next to you, either the grey or the black one. This it's one. up to you. Look this at this. One. Look, Yeah, yeah. Ah. go for it. Go on. Will it, will it pull, pull it? Will it come? Will it come off? Oh. Or not? Pull the thing. That's it. So, so, yeah. Why is that? <laughs> because, because Whitley over here, it, it's nearly as If you could pass him a jazz, is that all right? <laughs> oh, dear. Whitley over here, look at what I've got. Some of my acoustic tiles. I've got some spare in the loft, so I need some of this. Uh, you know, I've, I've <laughs> prepared everything apart from some foam, so I'm, I'm ripping my studio apart for it. Oh, I see. That'll do, won't it? <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, so let me show you. People will know about the foam trick, I'm sure, right? But before I do that, let me show you a way where you can get, you know, like a reasonable 60s tone just by changing the technique you're using, right? So, um, so let's just, like, look at the scenario. I don't know, you're in a... A function band or you know you do you, you you're doing some gig where you, you're playing like loads of different uh, styles of music uh, so you might be going from something like that to doing like a rock and roll thing or whatever so what i would do is the first thing i, I am going to change my tone a little bit i'm going to use any any help i can get so the first thing i'm going to do is i'm going to roll off any top end so it's not i'm not doing any boosting or anything fancy so that um so you might use your tone control you might turn it down slightly but not too much doing what i'm about to do um uh, on on the bass side of things i would tend to set your pickup on on the front pickup for a more 60s thing like epiphone Rivoli's had the pickup right up here um you know so I, you know for me i would do that because you always get I love that sound, the the two pickup sound. You know, it's a much get that kind of I don't know cancellation thing going on, um, but it's a much smoother sound than than. So yeah, so I would I would personally move to to this pickup, uh, and that's it really. Yeah, yeah. So the what's happening is I'm just going to use a bit of palm muting, right? Let's see, um, I'll get a drum rhythm going. Hope everybody's well, by the way. Kind of a 60s sort of bass, uh, uh, sorry, drum rhythm, I would say. Let's try this. Okay, so a really kind of 60s kind of vibe. I mean, and it, that was really exposed as well. You know, that was like just me and a drum machine and the bass turned up louder than the drum machine. I was liking the bass faces there, Scott. Was it, oh, was it, was it, was it doing it? Was it doing the bass face? So, yeah, so hopefully that, you know, I, I felt like I was, I was listening to that in, in the ears that that was doing a reasonable facsimile, you know, of that kind of tone we were outlining earlier. So it'd be interesting to know what you think. Right, and um, and that just kind of works really well. So literally, right, I'm just going to switch between some different sounds now, but not doing anything except changing the way um, I use my fingers. So I'm going to keep it in a kind of P bassy mode, front pickup, right? Um, 
six, uh, So, you know, just nothing changed but the fingers. But I think you'll agree two complete, well, three completely different sounds there, right? So, yeah, so that that <laughs> is, you know, is, is is the kind of the most instant way you can do it. Um, you know, you're doing nothing but changing the way you're playing. I think it's really effective. By the way, like bonus thing, that sound also is does a reasonable facsimile of um, a double bass as well. I think I've spoken about this before. So if I get a swing rhythm going, so if you're doing some jazz stuff, some of you might use this already, right? Uh, let me know. Let Janet know, and she'll let me know. Well, um, just actually, Gary got back to you regarding the uh, thing you were asking him, and he said, pickup imbalance. Neck pickups usually are wound less than the bridge, so you get an impedance mismatch That's on the it. middle setting. Yeah. Yes. Um, oh, wait a minute. Is it, is it got insert? insertion loss insertion loss that's it yeah that's and that's what gary's talking about yeah yes insertion loss i was going to say get the camera back on you <laughs> <laughs> yeah and, so, and david actually i think he, the way he uh goes for the 60s sound uh he says tone down light fingers play close to the neck also heavy compression that's my way of emulating vintage 60s tone that's pretty good as well yeah that's gonna work you know and it's it's there are different ways of doing it now that's a bass face is that me <laughs> do, 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 do. mark smith says thumb plucking yeah so uh, I've was just... that you thumb plucking <laughs> <laughs> it was, yes. So and Gary says yes with regards to the. That's uh, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it was. Um, you know, that was demonstrating how you can use that kind of approach to to do jazz stuff as well. So somebody mentioned, give me that one again. Can you remember? It's torn down. Uh, yeah. Play well, lightly with the fingers. Torn down, light fingers. Yeah. Play close to the neck. Yeah. Also heavy compression. Yeah. Uh, that's his way. Okay. David's way. So let's have a listen to that. That's yeah. That's going to give you a fatter sound. So I'm going to turn the tone down as much as I can on this thing. I'm going to play up here. <laughs> Gary says, my bass face makes me look like I'm chewing a wasp. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Love that. Right, okay, let's have a go. Here we go. Uh, so I get get our 60s rhythm back. Um, here we go. Yeah, so that's that's doing a good job. That's doing um, that's getting you closer to the kind of EBO kind of sound. And the reason is, obviously, they had the pickup. That's a Gibson basses. They had the pickup right up here, uh, and with plucking there, you kind of hit in that that spot. You know, and I don't know how that's c coming through YouTube, um, but it's oh, on Facebook. But it's a lot fatter sounding, a lot thicker. You know. But what it doesn't do um, is it doesn't deal with the kind of the shape of the note, right? So so basically like really old strings or those 60s basses like Jameson was playing and things like that um, with the mute, you know, the bit of foam under the strings um, or the or the hollow bodied instruments. What they, they do is they do like a very quick attack. So you get boom, you know, so, it's softer than, than, it's not like, you know, not like that. Hey, up, that. Right, um, but the boom, and then it decays quickly. Right, so let me show you the difference. 
I'll crank the bass a little bit, the instrument, not the bottom end. Hang on. Right. So here we go. This is like tone in the middle, so you can just hear what the, the notes are doing. And I'll turn the compression off for a minute so that it's not squashing the note at all. So this is no compression, right? This is um, a, just, just a single note, right? I know you could have sussed that out for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, so the note's just doing this kind of like same thing. It's just kind of, it's coming in at a certain volume. I'm trying not to make it have a peak at the, at the front, whereas if you're digging hard, you get, yeah. Um, and then it's just kind of staying on. Now, what happened with a lot of those 60s basses was, and, and basses with old flat wounds is, you got this kind of, so you get, you know, if I, could, if I could show you that waveform on the screen, you've got a bump at the beginning, right? And then it goes quiet and, and, and tails off, right? But there's an initial really quick, like, loss of volume after you've played it, boom, and then it doesn't sustain as much. And, it, and that, actually, it's, it's, a, it's a sound thing. You can hear it happen. But more than that, it's a feel thing. It really changes the way things feel you really notice it with like walking lines let me let me show you check this out right um, so we'll go back to that kind of swing thing and for a minute right so here's like without any kind of muting going on a one two three four And now I'm going to use that other approach where I kind of use some muting. Just see what the difference is between the feel. I'll try and swap between the two techniques so you can hear the difference. Here we go. So here we go. Here's the... Ha! <laughs> So my take on that, be interested to know what you think, is that I prefer the, I kind of prefer this sound, right? But I prefer the shape of the note that you get when you do the muting, right? But you're stuck here. Because you're muting, right? I'm using that part of my hand to mute on the strings there. I can't move from there. This is the only place I can plug, and I can only do it with my thumb. So uh, before I carry on, any any more stuff come in, Jam? Uh no, actually. No. I, think, I think they're all like... <laughs> They've all listening. left. They've all <laughs> they're, they're all left or they're listening <laughs> intently. Right. So, this is where the foam comes in for me. It it allows you to get the best of both worlds, or better than, than either, if you like, if you want to put it that way. Is that the same, Jan? I don't know. <laughs> so, this is, like, completely not ideal. <laughs> it's the wrong shape. So, I'm just kind of looking at it as I go. I'm going to go this way, right? But anyway, any kind of form you can experiment with stuff, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do it. To, you know, even like a rolled up handkerchief or a sock or anything like if, you, if you're in a pinch. Um, and what you do is, if you've not done this before, all, all that happens is this is going to go under the strings, right? So I'm going to, um, let's see if we can get it in shot. I'm just going to put it under here. I'm just going to work it in. This bass is filthy. And this might be too much. Um, we'll just see. We'll just see. But what this is going to allow us to do, this is going to do the same kind of job as the palm muting, right? But it's going to leave us free to have fun and use whatever technique we want with the other hand. Now, this may be too much. Let's have a see. Not actually as much as I thought it would be, but there you go. But you can hear you've got that same... Bow. 
It's not as pronounced, but you could you could mess around the, on this particular base. You know, the bridge pickup's quite near the bridge. But if you've got more space, if you move the form that way, you'll get a, a more pronounced muting effect, right? But it's, it's near enough, right? Now, the first thing I'm going to do, because um, I'm now using my fingers, I can hear a lot more treble, right? Because I'm not, yeah. So what I'm going to do is roll some of the high end off. I don't want to roll too much off. I want there to be a hint of it there. And now I'm going to add some bottom end in to kind of fatten it up. This doesn't sound quite as fat as it did when I was using the palm music because it's not as extreme. Right? So, by the way, if you've got um, a passive bass, you'd probably just want to roll some of the, uh, the treble off, okay? We haven't even looked at amps. Um, you know, hope, I'll just have a quick look at that in a minute. Um, but this is all... The idea of this is just to be able to do it with what you've got, you know, like without having to worry about, you know, changing equipment too much. Um, yes, this is a bit tricky. You wouldn't really want to do this, like, in the middle of a song, but you could just, if you had a piece cut nicely, you could just stick it in there before you do, like, a, a rock and roll number or 60s thing or a 70s thing, right? So it's certainly easier than going and buying a vintage bass. <laughs> okay. Let's see how that works with the, uh, the 60s kind of drum rhythm. You know, the straight ahead uh, beat. See what you think. It's pretty good. What do you think, Jan? I think that sounds great. It's pretty good. How how do you think that compares to the, you know, the 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 muting? Does it sound similar? Do you, have you got a preference on those two? Just do it again. Well, I'll have to take the form off to the other one, Mrs. Whitley. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> or do you not mm. similar? You'd say similar. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'll get you out of that one. Thoughts uh, for the viewers at home as well. Be interested, right? But <laughs> as I say, it's not quite as pronounced to, to my ears. But that's mainly because I can't get the form that way enough, right? And also, you could use, like, more dense form or whatever. But this is pretty pressed up against the strings. I reckon if... Let me just try and shove it that way as much as I can. It'll be throwing the intonation off. You've got to be careful. You've got to retune. And, and if you play up high, things can go kind of weird, right? That's not bad. Now... What this allows me to do now is have complete freedom with my technique, but have that different shape to the note. So let's try, was it David's approach? David Milne, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Let's try David Milne's approach, but with this going on. Uh, and I know something I'm going to try in a minute, which is really cool as well, where, you know, I was talking about using this pickup um, for this, but you can do a really cool thing with, the, with that pickup um, when you've got the mute in there, for like a double bass sound. So here we go. Uh, let's put the drum rhythm on. And I'm going to try that thing. Wow. Let me turn it up a little bit. Drums down. Over, two, three, different key, F. That G's a bit too muted. That's better. So that, I think, is probably, like, the best result yet today. What do you think, Jan? Sounds I think that's, great. That's really good. So that's combining those two techniques uh, and just before I move on if we put it on the on the if you've got you know if you've got a bridge pickup as well I remember doing this with a, a Dan Electro bass the first time I tried it um, doing the foam and putting it on that pickup which is not nearly as deep sounding because you know bridge pickups tend to be thinner 
be interested to see how it works today, but I found it, it, it gave more of that kind of woody, upright bass kind of tone, right? Let's try it. Hang on. So I'm going to uh, dial in a swing rhythm again. Ah, there we go. And do you know what I'm going to do? Because I've got the luxury of it, I'm going to dial in some more low end. I'm going to dial in, I've got a bass control here, so I'm going to, like, pull some of that up. All right. So treble's still taken down a little bit, just smoothing it off. Let's have a listen. Hit one, hit two, hit one. That's pretty cool. Let me just pull the bass up for for the cats at home. We're doing jazz speak now, Jam. All right. <laughs> okay. Bit more bottom end even than that. But uh, yeah. Yeah, so that's, in my mind, that's not a bad, you know, sort of double bass kind of, you know, representation because you've got that whole shape of the note thing. It's doing the boom, 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 but you've got that woody kind of growl you get from from, um, from an actual upright. So, has there anything else come in, Jan? No. Has everybody gone? I don't know. It's very strange. Everyone's <laughs> gone very quiet. <laughs> Are you there? <laughs> Someone, someone knock three times or something like that if you're there. <laughs> All right. So um, I'm hoping we're still live. I mean, are, are we? It's do we showing know? that we're still live. I thought, yeah, I can't see anything. Maybe, but yeah, maybe it's. It, <laughs> so, um, so the last thing I wanted to talk about is 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 amps right now. Just change the camera back to you. Sorry, I do that a lot, Donna. <laughs> the, I, I want to talk about amps. Um, and, you know, the fact that, again, going for that kind of vintage song, we should try a pick as well, um, is, again, you could turn the tweeter off. If you've got tweeters or horns in, in a cab and you want to get that 60 sound, you could, you could do that. But I think, for me, if you can use your tone control to do it, it's, it's more instant. You don't have to fiddle around and stuff like that. But having said that, if most of what you're going to do, and I think this is what it is, you've got to, think what is what I'm, what do I want to do most you know particularly if it's like one instrument using um for me I want to be able to switch from all kinds of different sounds you know so that's why you know I've, I've adopted these kind of techniques that allow me to do that 60s thing but also do other stuff as well if you go down the full on put flat wounds on turn the tweeter off you know do all that stuff if that's your main thing, it makes sense. But for me, I'd, I'd like I like to be still nobody there, Jan. No. Let's just see uh, if if it can pull some uh, comments up because it just seemed kind of weird that nobody's. It says there's 16 people with us. Um, All right. Well, it might still be working. But um, yeah, it's just strange. Everybody's usually chit chat. But have you had a look on your phone, perhaps? See if there's anything. Uh, let me see. Ben's at the front door. Right. So. <laughs> So let's just try let's try a couple of things. Um, I'm going to do something that that makes sense for a minute, you know, something kind of practical, and I'm going to try a pick, right? And what I'm going to do actually, I'm going to use, um, you know, the old Jim Dunlop nylon vibe thing. So this kind of thing, if if you know what I'm saying. Oh, cracky! Oh, yeah, we are still live, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and let's see how that sounds. I'm going to go back to the P bass pickup. All right. Now already. Ah, oh, now this is really strange. It's restream, Scott. That's not doing it because there's all kinds of comments. Oh no way! What a shame. Right. Um, so, so just so you know, everybody, we 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 are working hard here to to kind of just improve things on the stream. You know, be able to. Uh, did the comments thing has that been working, Jam? Where you can highlight comments. Yeah, yeah. That's good. Yeah, but, it, but um, obviously we've got teething problems, you know. Yeah, Gary, uh, Gary last commented at sixteen fifty four, and that was the last comment that I can That's see. That's mad. So we're so, so well. Let's take a minute. If if there's some comments you can see there, John, I'm going to pull up. Um, Pat saying I'm here. Pat Delaney. Pat, uh, let's have a look. Um, 
I went, David Mills said, yeah, I can't pluck with my thumb, so it's all right, I'm muting, or a trailing Inga. And then he put finger, <laughs> not Inga. Got you. Okay. <laughs> um, Mark Smith said it sounds amazing. Oh, cool. Uh, <laughs> Just really, really quick thing, <laughs> right? I was like, oh, my God, it must sound just rubbish <laughs> it must all be in my head i must be, you know i thought it sounded all right i thought you know like radio sounds sort of good i'm yeah. glad you liked it you know yeah yeah it, it, they're probably thinking it was us ignoring them yeah oh, you know dear. um and david actually it says i actually on nord strand nordy mute forgot i had it until now right um, yeah really cool i think um is it greg might have one of those greg harper yeah but anyway we'll have to um David says, knock, knock, knock. <laughs> <laughs> Who's there? Yeah, because that's what I asked for. Right, cheers. Yeah. <laughs> Mark Smith, keep it on, Jan. Uh, was yeah. that the camera? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, keep it on, Jan. No. Um, Patrick Sweeney, we're transfixed. <laughs> that's what it was. They were transfixed. <laughs> um, cool, as I'm glad you're all still there, guys. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was well weird. That was strange, I must admit. Hopefully it's a glitch. We'll we'll try and do some testing, but it's kind of difficult. I'm going to have to set up like a an anonymous YouTube channel to te- because there's no way with this method we're doing of doing like a, a private li- um, you know, stream, so we just had to wing it. But, yeah. I don't actually understand why it stopped because it all the comments were coming through. Yeah. Oh, okay, but no, we'll uh, do some testing. Yeah. Uh Mark's asking what gauge of pick do you use? Okay. Um let's let's stick with that for a minute. Um, so I, I, it kind of varies and I don't know if you saw I just kind of swapped a little bit the one I normally use the, the pics I normally use are these Fred Kelly guys um, look at that change his camera hang on it will focus I, I'm sure of it come on do it there you go and they're pretty thin pretty flexible and um they they were the ones I really fell in love with when I was doing the big country stuff. Um, you know, they're just great, like really quick picks. They've got this really pointed attack is the best way I can explain it. There's none of that scratchy sound that you get with some picks. Let me just try like a generic um, type of pick. Um, you hear that? Right, because I just kind of default to a little bit of an angle me, you know, with... Um, with my hand, it, it just, you know, and you get that. Now, some people like it, I don't, but for some magical reason, these Fred Kelly picks, right, they virtually don't do it. Magic. So, yeah, they're really thin. But then again, um, with that, my mind went somewhere else. I don't mean that in a, in a losing my mind way, but... Uh, you know, and I, and I decided to use a Jim, Jim Dunlop that was like a one mil, I think it is, the black ones, yeah. And they're kind of softer material, um, so you get a slightly smoother... If you can hear the difference, these are really attacky, the, the Fred Kelly, right? Bang! Like a kick drum. Love those things. Jim Dunlop one mil. You can really hear, can you hear that, John? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Just goes to show it really, really makes a difference. So, you know, that that that's what I would probably have pulled out for doing 60 stuff to get slightly softer attack. Yeah. So what's the difference with those two picks? The difference is that the, 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 the yellow one is thinner. Yeah. Right? Which was the one that sounded really 60s, the second. The, the, yeah, that's a Jim Dunlop, which is super common. It's probably what, like, most people, um, you know, get into. Um that and guy. is that thicker? What makes that sound so? It's because it's it's thicker, so yeah. it doesn't flex. So you get you get a, a softer attack, and yeah. also the material softer. Ah, right. It's not okay. as hard as plastic. So that's what you need to go for if you're trying to that's, get the yeah. Or, or if you really want to go for it, like one of those felt picks, it'll do it. If you want to go the other way, <laughs> those attack picks. <laughs> yeah. Any more, Jack? Uh, Gary's saying he's still with us. He's grain filling a base whilst listening. I love it. <laughs> God, oh, we should like be, be really, we should do a world tour and just come and visit everybody and uh, you know live stream from different locations. That'd, That'd be, be cool. great. Yeah. yeah. yeah would, would. Um, Mark's saying he, he, I use a two millimeter pick. Is that thick? 
Um, that is pretty thick, yeah. You know, that's um, that'd be something like that, I guess. That's that's got to be about two mil, and and that doesn't flex at all. Now, what? These are interesting because because when you get onto stubby picks, thicker picks, you get um, you get much less attack. But it's not a dark sound, you know. You got like it's, you got this glassy kind of high end. Can you hear that? I don't know. If, I'll let me crank the treble so you can hear it. Let me accentuate it. You got that when the pick touches. You get that, but the actual if I touch first, if I touch first, sounds really weird. <laughs> touch first, touch first, and then pull off, Janet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it sounds like, but obviously. That's not how we play, you know. You, you've got so you always get that little kind of click, and then a softer kind of note. So, good choice actually for sixties. If you kind of, um, you know, let me roll a little bit of the high off or vintage, you know. And of course, you can hold them loosely in your hand. And let's compare that to the Jim Dunlop. That's actually got lots more attack, uh, but it's not as clicky as the the thin one. So let's do that again. So let's start with thin. Lots and lots of uh, attack. Softer material, but thicker. So it's still got a nice quick attack but it's kind of like lowering the frequency range. You know, it's not, not like a high frequency thing. And then really thick pick. Like I say, you get that kind of little click. It's kind of nice uh, when you touch the strings, but the actual note is, is softer. Gary's mentioned as well, he says, nut material also makes quite a difference to tone. For example, brass versus tusk. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, um, now, the thing is about this, and I'd be interested to know what your thoughts on this are, Gary, because, um, uh, but, you know, obviously, all the notes. Super what just chat. Who was that, Chad? <laughs> Pat Delaney uh, has done a super chat. He says, for Scott's secret vintage Fender fund. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't tell him. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you so much, Pat. Thank you. That's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> Very much appreciate. By the way, you know, the, these Super Chats, um, they really do make a difference. Like this thing that we're doing that's kind of gone a little bit wrong with the, um, you know, with the chat over there and, and being able to pull people's comments up and things like that. You know, it's, it's a small but additional cost, you know. Um, and we're always trying to sort of find that line between improving what we're doing and uh, yeah, so it really makes a difference. So thank you so much for that. Ma As Mark also, sorry, uh, did you oh. want to? Mark says it's uh, your stream, Jan. <laughs> Shut <laughs> up. Uh, I tried some five millimeter rubber picks. Awful. That almost sounds like a like a joke, you know. Like yeah, that's yeah. I didn't know there was such a thing, you know. Picks are mad, right? But th th there are some great picks around. Anyone ever use dragon? Stop. I'm trying to pull the camera on you. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness. Anyone have you used dragon picks? Right, the, let me turn that round. That's mad. Yeah. There's a guy I should give him a plug. Um, uh, who, who, I'll, in fact, I'll get some details and put him on the uh, his stuff on the screen next time who makes picks locally. Um, but basically, these are like really expensive. I think they're like 20 quid each or something like that. Um, you know, and uh, I got asked to check them out. Uh, which was really nice. And they're very cool, but I've never let them go out the house. I've still got them years on, and it's because <laughs> if I took them on a gig, that would be the last time you'd ever see them, you know. I have to buy them in 20s and 30s, you know. So, um, yeah, I don't know how I go on to that, but there you go. Any more, John? Uh, no, I'm really sorry here, Scott. I'm just trying to uh, get, you know, I'm trying to check that I'm not missing You're doing anything. a good job. You're doing a great job. <laughs> Um, so what I'll do while Jan just checks that, so we do apologise if we lost, which we have, some some of the comments and stuff. Uh, I can't just see, see, I have the comments here, but, uh, you know, the, I just catch them now and again. Gary Denny, my bass face makes me <laughs> look like I'm chewing a wasp. Yeah, I have this weird thing I do where, um, like, my mouth kind of, like, goes, you know, like, 
<laughs> when I'm concentrating. But uh, anyway. It's a good job you don't just let you hang. Uh, you, you hang. Let me hang let out. Let your tongue hang out like Sid and Clarence. We have, we have two pet pygmy goats and, <laughs> and sometimes the tongue just like literally hangs a bit. <laughs> Yeah, right, anyway, uh, but <laughs> swiftly moving on. I'm not gonna... Sometimes, sometimes my thoughts come out. <laughs> yeah, I love it. That's, I think that's why people tune in, actually. So I'm going to uh, wrap this up in a minute. I, I want to actually, I, uh, I really wanted to give something, a, uh, maybe after. I wanted to sing a song, actually, funnily enough. I've been thinking about it since this afternoon, doing all the 60s stuff, because I used to do a lot of it. Um, but I'd need to find my backing track. I'll see if I can anyway in a minute. But really quickly, um, let's just kind of recap on what we what we did to arrive here. Sorry, I just another <laughs> on, thing because Gary's really knowledgeable. Obviously, he I have is a lot very. Of stuff, uh, you know, because if you haven't checked him out, Gary Denyer Bases is great. In um, fact, if you look on on the YouTube channel after after the stream, if you go on the community tab, there's like links to his his channel and stuff. I didn't realize he'd been. You've been doing his channel that long. Um, there's so much stuff there. Go on. Sorry, uh, But he, yeah, he, another comment he said is string break angle over the nut and bridge also changes the standing wave of the string. Yeah, right, yeah, yes. Yeah, and, and, and with that being said, you know, like the SWB1, um, you know, it, you know, it has that kind of like either you can through body string it or or top load it and there is definitely a difference you know and uh, funnily enough i'd say you get more of a you know more of that that woolly edge to it not woolly but more of that vintagey thing if you top load you know um, oh. <laughs> what's this what's up jan <laughs> oh dear I'm tr I'm going through three different things so I don't miss right, anything. Right, right, yeah, yeah. But Mark Smith said owners look like their pets. <laughs> Doof, ouch. Oh. oh, dear. Obviously talking about, you know, you can't... can't well, it must be me with the hair. You know, they've got the big coats, haven't they? Crazy. Right. <laughs> Any more, Jan? Uh, I don't think so. I'm, like I say, I'm back and forth here, so... Yeah. So, anyway, like, just... Please do comment, you know, when the tech was working, when, when Jan was putting the comments up on the screen and stuff. Um, tell me what you think of that. You know, was it was it cool? I think you know, the idea was very cool. Um, and it, and she's got a method when it works where she can pin the comments now, right, you know, yeah. and, and so we don't lose them. Uh, and the super chats pop right up. So, yeah. And so, it's great, actually, this new method, because hopefully I won't miss, uh, <laughs> well, that's when they're all appearing here, but they won't. I won't miss them because I can actually, you know, clear yeah. the ones I've done. Yeah, you can. You, she can put pin into one side and kind of pull them out from the the general chat, and then and then you know, as time goes on, she can just literally, um, yeah. Go we're get, we're getting there, aren't we? We're getting there. I think so. Yeah. I don't know where we're getting. I don't know, but we're definitely getting there. <laughs> so really quickly, let me just do some have a little fun for just a couple of minutes, right? And what I'm, I'm not saying I didn't enjoy the rest of it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to like play like me if you know what i mean you know do do my thing you know just enjoy myself do a bit of slapping and whatever just for a couple of minutes but using this stuff we've done to the the base you know the form thing because that's what i was doing a quick recap wasn't i so yeah essentially um you know the, there were there were two main elements that we we looked at one is the shape of the note you know in terms of attack and decay and um, people who are into like synthesis and stuff will know all about that um, and we wanted it to have a, a, a quick attack and then a quick decay and then maybe just a little bit of sustain behind it. So we're, I was using palm muting, so that's really an instant way you can just do on a gig or whatever, just for a few bars or something. Um, with even a bright sound, you know, you can you can tame it right down. And then um, David Milne was talking about this, you know, this approach he uses for playing up near the neck and that gi gives you an even more 60s kind of sound but then you can't palm mute so what we've done is we've done the muting and now we can do that and now what i'm going to do is just use that kind of approach and do all the stuff and let's just see what it sounds like it's a lot of fun actually because uh, your bass responds really differently that g is a little much let me just rip some form off here this is really technical stuff look at this you know you're going to make precise measurements with with this <laughs> Hang on. I reckon if I just pull some off <laughs> and uh, let's see how that's so that's touching. See, I might be stupid, but it worked. 
right? So, yeah, here we go. Just say goodbye to Pat. He says, got to go See you, get Pat. food for the family. Catch you on the next one. Bye, people. Thank Bye, you. Bye, Pat. Cheers, Pat. Lovely to have you here as usual. All right, let's uh, let's go with this. I think David's off as well, actually, Scott. He says, it's been a great show, you two. I'll tune in next week for another episode of Carry On Whitley's. <laughs> <laughs> it's brilliant. Hey, so it's, it's a little slicker than last week. That was hilarious, wasn't it? <laughs> But that's, yeah, what a lot of fun. I mean, what a different sound. I mean, it's just mad, isn't it? Just off the back of doing this um, this live stream. And I'm definitely going to use that vibe on on, an, on a track, you know. Mm. Like, I just don't think I'd think to do that. I think, um, you know, see if anybody agrees. You know, if you use these kind of techniques already, if you've used them in the past, you know, it would be like this, you know. Um, oh, we're doing a 60s kind of thing. Ah, you know, a remote time thing. I'll do the foam thing. I'll do all the, the 60s thing. I wouldn't think I'm going to do a funky thing. I'll put some foam rubber and slap the bass, you know. But how cool is that, right? Mark, Mark Smith's saying you should record a solo album. Yes, I should. I've got an EP out, actually. Um, and again, in future streams, we'll have all the links ready to go and stuff. But, um, but if you go on Bandcamp, if you want to, you know, um, and search for Scott Whitley. There is, a, there are a few tracks on there, uh, but uh, yeah, I'm working on an album. But yeah, that's a really cool sound. And it's really quick. The other thing I was going to do is use the very attacky pick, right, with the thumb mute and the same setting. So it's the same settings I was using for the '60s thing. I think I've got a little more treble dialed in, if I'm honest. Right. Let's try that. Uh, and let's spin the dial on 90 Soul. What even is that? <laughs> I don't even know what that is. It sounds too much like the other one. Let's 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 go crazy. Funk rock. All right. So this is like the 60s kind of mute thing with a pick. Let's see what we can pull out of that. It's, I, I was, I'm liking that. Another cool sound. <laughs> the only thing about that is, because I tend to play with the pick back here, I was kind of finding, it, you know, I almost wanted to, to just do the palm muting anyway, really quickly. Let me try picking here. That's kind of getting a... Uh, Is that the professionals or something like that? Or Sweeney, is it? I reckon it is. Yeah, uh, mm, I'm not sure now. It's the two guys, isn't it? Uh, 
that the professionals, the two guys? I think it's the professionals, yeah. So you're almost getting that kind of... Anyway, I'm going to shut up now. <laughs> it is also 5.30. It is. Hope you've enjoyed the stream, everybody. Um, hey, you- I just mentioned there's, uh, you've got a couple of offers of musicians for the uh, solo album. Oh, fantastic. Mark Smith says, can I play sax on your next album? And David yeah. Mills says, can I play bass on your next album? Yeah. In fact, <laughs> you know what would be really cool is, is if I could get enough people together to just do everything. <laughs> And I'll, I'll I'll go on a walk. <laughs> Mark says, "Have a base off." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fantastic. Um, yeah, we've got lots of plans. Uh, by the way, thanks for sticking with us. You know, I really should tie these t- things down a little bit to to an hour. But, but anyway, thank you for sticking with it. And um, you know, we've we've got big plans for the future with these streams. We're just going to keep chip away each week and make them a little better. Look out for a new video on Tuesday. I think it's a bit of a turning point. Oh, and quickly, just before we go, um, if you know, if you haven't already seen Janet's artwork, um, can ah, is it working? Can you pull the picture up? Or has it stopped working? Oh, there, let Janet? me see. Let me see. Oh, hang on. Uh, do, 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 do. It may have stopped working. There we go. Is that there? Well, I can't see it, but yeah. Ah, so, so I see it. So she's yeah. This is Jan's artwork. Jan is, like, really super, super talented uh, when it comes to art. And uh, I said, like, give yourself, you know, give the channel a little plug. It's not a channel. It's um, you're on Instagram and Facebook, right, Jan? Yes. Now, how do I get... Uh, oh, dear. It doesn't, it doesn't want to go away. Does it not? Oh, uh, here we go. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, do do check her stuff out. You know, um, it, it's just... It, it still amazes me. You know, it just blows my mind. Um, so... Um, yeah, did you manage to share that, Jan? Uh, I did. Are we yeah. still on the screen, or is it just uh, is the no, picture still up? All good. No, we're all, all gone. Good. So yeah, so do check Janet out. Uh, absolutely amazing. Um, check her her artwork out. Mm, and you. well, it's true. <laughs> it's just amazing. So thank you again, everybody. Like I say, um, look out for the new video. Um, I, I really love to know what your thoughts are. So when it when it drops on Tuesday at four. Please drop some comments in there, good or bad, you know, because constructive criticism is, is good. But you've been working super, super hard, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, the past two weeks I've just been buried. Mate, is it three? I've, I've literally lost track of, of how long it was, but I've just been buried in here learning how to use DaVinci Resolve, which is, um, you know, just nothing was familiar at all. <clears throat> so it's been fairly full on. But yeah, uh, I just saw it as an opportunity, you know, to at that point to try and up the video production level as well and try and make the videos flow better. You know, um, it's a little bit more scripted and so that, the, you know, it might even work as, as, as a podcast as well, I hope. So it's very exciting, though. Very exciting. Yeah. So thanks, everyone, again for your support. And, you know, uh, look out for the video on Tuesday. And other than that, we'll see you next sunday at 4 p.m uk time 8 p.m eastern and 11 pacific is that right john uh now or, you're asking <laughs> one sec we'll go with that <laughs> there we go it is uh, four o'clock uk 11 o'clock eastern and eight o'clock pacific it's the wrong way around <laughs> <laughs> right okay so yeah what I'll, she said i'll leave that on the screen yeah. see you then guys <laughs> thanks so much And Janet, you'll have to say bye and you'll have to end the stream if you can over there. Goodbye.